Newfoundland sealing disaster. Sent to the ice after white coats, rough outfits slung on coiled rope belts, they stoop to the slaughter. Gaff pups slit them free of their spotless pelts. The storm came on unexpected. Stripped clean of bearings, the watch struck for the waiting ship and missed it. Hovelled in darkness two nights then, bent blindly to the sleet's raw work, bodies muffled close for shelter, stepping in circles like blinkered mules, the wind jerking like a halter. Minds turned by the cold, lured by small comforts their stubborn hearts rehearsed, men walked off ice floes to the arms of phantom children, wives, of fires laid in imaginary hearths. Some surrendered movement and fell, molting warmth flens from their faces, as the night and bitter wind doled out their final pitiful wages. What's lost? The Labrador coastline is a spill of islands, salt shaker tumble of stone, a cartographer's nightmare. On the coastal boat fifty years ago, the third mate marked his location after dark by the outline of a headland against the stars, the sweetly acrid smell of bake apples blowing off a stretch of bog to port or starboard, navigating without map or compass where hidden shoals shadow the islands like the noise of hammers echoed across a valley. The largest are home to harbors and coves, a fringe of clapboard houses threaded by dirt road, gray fence cemeteries sinking unevenly into mossy grass. Even those too small to be found on the map once carried a name in someone's mind, a splinter of local history. A boat racked up in a gale of wind, the roof-wrecked remains of a stage house hunkered in the lee. Most of what I want him to remember lies among those islands, among the maze of granite rippling north a thousand miles, and what he remembers is all I have a claim to. My father nods toward the coastline, to the bald stone shoals almost as old as light. That was fifty years ago, he says, as a warning, wanting me to understand that what's forgotten is lost, and most of this he cannot even recall forgetting. Bread I was twenty years younger than my husband his first wife dead in childbirth. I agreed to marry him because he was a good fisherman, because he had his own house, and he was willing to take in my mother and father when the time came. It was a practical decision, and he wasn't expecting more than that. Two people should never say the word love before they've eaten a sack of flour together, he told me. The night we married, I hiked my nightdress around my thighs and shut my eyes so tight I saw stars. Afterwards, I went outside and I was sick, throwing up over the fence. He came out the door behind me and put his hand to the small of my back. It happens your first time, he said. It'll get better. I got pregnant right away, and then he left for the Labrador. I dug the garden, watched my belly swell like a seed in water. Baked bread, bottled baked apples for the winter store, cut the meadow grass for hay. After a month alone, I even started to miss him a little. The baby came early, a few weeks after my husband arrived home in September. We had the minister up to the house for the baptism the next day. Angus McLean, we named him. And we buried him in the graveyard in the burnt woods a week later. I remember he started crying at the table the morning of the funeral, and I held his face against my belly until he stopped his head in my hands about the size of the child before it was born. I don't know why sharing a grief will make you love someone. I was pregnant again by November. I baked a loaf of bread and brought it to the table, still steaming from the oven, set it on his plate whole and stood there looking at him. That's the last of that bag of flour, I told him. And he smiled at me and didn't say anything for a minute. I'll pick up another today, he said finally. 
And that's how we left it for a while. Her Mark I, Ellen Rose of Western Bay, in the Dominion of Newfoundland, married woman, mother, stranger to my grandchildren, in consideration of natural love and affection, hereby give and make over unto my daughter, Minnie Jane Crummy of Western Bay, a meadow garden situated at Riverhead, bounded to the north and east by Lovey's estate, to the south by John Lynch's land, to the west by the local road leading countrywards, bounded above by the sky, by the blue song of angels and God's stars, below by the bones of those who made me. I leave nothing else. Every word I have spoken the wind has taken, as it will take me, as it will take my grandchildren's children, their heads full of fragments, and my face not among those. The day will come when we are not remembered. I have wasted no part of my life in trying to make it otherwise. In witness thereof, I have set my hand and seal this 13th day of December, 1933. And the deed is signed Ellen Rose, and the name is marked with an X, and the X has been designated her mark. Jig's Dinner Out of bed by seven to leave plenty of time to dress for church. The salt beef and soak overnight to take off the brine. Put it on to boil in the largest pot in the pantry. Drain off half the salt water and replace it with fresh every hour. Clear a spot on the counter. Start the vegetables. Potatoes. Potatoes are inevitable, like grace before a meal. You'll want a spud for everyone eating, two if they're smaller than your fist. The skin is mottled brown and spotted with eyes. The flesh is white and damp. The taste is neither here nor there, like its color. It complements everything you serve. Cut the largest in half or three to avoid stony pits enduring after everything else is ready to eat. Carrots. Carrots are the middle child, no one's particular favorite, but well enough liked by all. A good rule of thumb is to cook more than you think you need. Never worry about leftovers. A carrot holds its flavor like no other vegetable. It tries so hard to please. Turnip and parsnip. Predictable vegetables, sturdy and uncomplicated, tasting of the winter root cellar, the warmth of darkness smoldering beneath snow. Turnip is served mashed with a tablespoon of butter and a pinch of fresh pepper. Parsnip served like carrot, the beautifully tapered torso laid naked on the plate. Greens. Leaf and stalk of the turnip boiled until tender, the dark green of deep water shoals. As tart as spinach and better for you, the limp stock wrapped around your fork like thread on a spool, a spill of green liquor on your lips with every mouthful. Cabbage. Similar to lettuce, but heavier and more densely rounded. The quieter and more secretive of two siblings. Too firm and fibrous to be eaten raw, boil the cabbage whole until the inner leaves have paled almost to white and part before a fork like the Red Sea before the staff of Moses. Onions. Slip the pocket of tears from its papery shell. Do not bring the knife near the flesh. Drop two or three whole onions into the pot to cook the tang from the core. Eat them by the forkful, the translucent layers soft and sweet as orange sections, every bit of bitterness boiled away. When the church bell peels, place all vegetables to boil with the salt meat. The peas pudding is wrapped separately in cheesecloth or a piece of rag and placed last in the pot before leaving for church at a quarter to eleven. By 12.30, everything is ready. Take up the vegetables in separate dishes and people will serve themselves as they please. Ladle a spoonful of the salty liquor from the pot over your food or dip up a mugful to drink with your meal. Protect your Sunday clothes with a linen or cotton napkin. 
bow your heads before you eat. Be thankful. 32 little stories. This was before Confederation, so I don't know why we were being taught French at the school. We had a textbook called 32 Little Stories. There was only enough to go around the class so the teacher would borrow mine during the lesson, and I moved back a seat to share with the person sitting behind me. Kitch Williams would pronounce a word or sentence from the book, and we were supposed to repeat it back to him, but I didn't bother opening my mouth half the time. It was all gibberish to me. Kitch decided he'd had enough of that one afternoon and got me up in front of the class alone. I guess I sounded a bit like a wounded animal trying to heave it out of me. It's a goddamn silly language anyway, if you want my opinion. And the whole school had a good laugh about it. Father had an old shotgun I used to take out hunting partridge on the weekends with Jet Slade and Patty Fitzgerald. A double-barreled thing that hardly left enough meat on a bird to make a meal of it. The three of us went out over the barrens that Saturday, and I took 32 little stories along with me. Opened it to the correct page, stood it up on an old tree stump, stepped back three paces, and shot the fucking thing. Had to walk 12 feet past the tree stump to find it. Next French lesson, I moved back to sit at the desk behind me, and Kitch Williams picked up my copy to start. The look on his face when he opened it. The book ripped by the lead shot, the paper melded together so you couldn't turn a page, the muscle in his cheek twitching, his eyeglasses shifting on his nose. My son, he said, putting the book on the desk in front of me, if you're not going to take care of this text, it would be just as well to put it in the stove. Mother always said it was a wonder I never got myself shot when I was a youngster. I picked the book up, walked to the pot-bellied stove at the back of the class, and dropped it in. The crackle of 32 little stories echoing around the room as I went back to my seat through the row of desks, the floorboards creaking under my feet. Quiet. My Jesus, it was quiet. No one in that class had a word in their heads to speak, not of English and not of French besides.